pretend that I come from future, but I, <laughs> but I actually came from Burning Man. <laughs> and, and Peter just showed the neighborhood that I live, so a lot of hope. Um, I wanted to tell you the story of resilience, and resilience at personal, organizational, and social level. But I want to start with my childhood. When I was a little girl, my Shanghai papa told me, Bamboo is flexible, bending with wing, but never break. Your ability to thrive depends on your attitude, taking everything in stride with grace. It's as though he knew challenges awaited me. And that was 1966, at the dawn of Cultural Revolution. I was eight years old. My life turned upside down. I was born and raised by this loving family, and I had five older siblings, and I was the youngest one. My mom loved to be in the kitchen with me, and she taught me the five essence of cooking. That's taste, color, texture, um, aroma, and love. And that day, my Shanghai papa was arrested. And the Red Guards coming to our house, and I heard the China being broken in our backyard. And I saw that they came for my mom, but they came for me. And it was then I learned that I wasn't born by my Shanghai parents, and they raised me. And my biologic parents actually lived in Nanjing, which is a city south of China, about 300 miles south. I was taken away from the home that I ever known, and um, they didn't even let me give a hug to my mom. And she just said, don't fight, Ping, don't fight. I was put in this really crowded train. Um, literally, I was pushed into the window, and I can't even put my feet on the ground. I was sitting on somebody's shoulder, I remember. And then those old gentlemen gave me a little wedge on the chairs that I could sit. I arrived in Nanjing just a little bit too late, and my biological parents were put on the truck sent to hard labor camp. And I was led to a single dormitory room at the university where my dad, biologic father, used to teach. And it was there I found my little sister. She was four years old. And the room was very dirty, and there was nothing in there. And the only shining spot was under her legs because she was kicking so much. Um, I lived there for the next 10 years. And at around 10 years old, I was beaten and raped, and it wasn't the physical pain that was the worst, but it was the emotional abuse followed. I was caught broken shoes. At that age, instead of studying at school, I was a ruined woman. I worked in factory, building radios, speedometers. I went to countryside, plant rice, and until roughly about 73 when Nixon visited China and it got a little better. Cultural Revolution was 10 years and I was unfortunate it was exactly when I was supposed to be first grade and it ended when I was supposed to graduate. So I didn't really study much of academics. But today is not the day to relive those horrific years. Um, I wanna bring my past experience to reflect how I became the woman today. Cultural Revolution ended, university restarted, and I was known as the girl whose light never turned off. And I really, really wanted to go to college. I wanted to be an astronaut. My dad was a professor at Aerospace Aeronautic uh, University. But I didn't have much um, hard science background, so I tried to take the exam, and all I could do was read and write, and I was accepted as a literature uh, student, actually assigned. 
My mom said, don't go because you're going to get in trouble. Study literature, but I really, really wanted to go to college. I didn't care what if next year I couldn't pass the exam. So I went to college uh, in 1978. And there was 10 years pending demand, and university just opened. There was very few universities. So that generation of the student was um, from different years. Some are 10 years older than me. Um, kind of in the younger generation. It was exhilarating. I really loved studying literature, you know, reading novels, watching, watching plays. You call that homework. That was paradise. And before I graduated, I wanted to go to graduate school to be a journalist. So I decided to choose a thesis um, for one-child policy. At that time, China was enforcing one-child policy at its peak. Um, every couple can only have one child. And there's also this concept which is unique to China, which is if you had one child, then pregnancy is illegal. And because it's illegal, there were forced uh, late-term abortions. So when I went to do my research, I witnessed horrific killing in the countryside. I saw girls being thrown into the river when their umbilical cords still are fresh. I saw a girl being thrown at a dumpster, left, left, there to be, uh, left there to die. It broke my heart. And I was obsessed because I couldn't do anything, and I turned my research to the teacher, and they, not, not to known to me, they turned it into the authority. And before I was graduating, about three months before, I was arrested on campus, someone put a sack over my head, and I was taken to jail. I thought surely I would die, but why now, when my life just turned around? But I was lucky. Cultural revolution was over. Deng Xiaoping, at the time, was controlling the country. I didn't get killed. I got kicked out of China. I was asked to leave, and quietly, and not filing political silence, find a place to go study, I was not welcome back. So I looked around and United States, fortunately, accepted me first. And in 1984, I boarded Pan Am Airline and landed in San Francisco. I didn't have money. I had a cashier's check for connecting fly and I spoke only a few words of English and I was $5 short for my connecting flight because in China, price doesn't change. Uh, 14 hours later when I get to San Francisco, the ticket price changed. And an American man standing behind me gave the $5 to the counter so I could go to University of New Mexico, which is where I enrolled as English as a second language student. And that taught me why in doubt always err on the side of generosity. Five dollars may not mean that much to him, but it meant a life to me. So that's how I landed in New Mexico, and I saw that I was going to study comparative literature. But my English was too poor, and I also discovered the professor who taught English didn't make much money, and some of them couldn't find jobs. So I have to find a... Um, field to study that I could find jobs. It was then I discovered the language of computer science. And instead of writing essays on montage, I was writing code for the future that not yet imagined. And that breakthrough changed the trajectory of my life personally and professionally. Then I after graduating, I worked at a startup company, and then I landed at University of Illinois at their supercomputing center. And it was there I hired a student, his name was Mark Andreessen, and our group wrote um, Mosaic, NCSA Mosaic that became Netscape uh, Internet Explorer. And it was then entrepreneurship was at its peak, and inter internet was all time hot. Jack Welch was saying, destroy yourself.com. Every company was starting .com company. Every company on the stage calls themselves .com. Remember, some microsystem calls themselves, we are the dot in .com. And 
Um, so university said, well, Ping, everything you, you touch turned into gold. What is the next killer app? And I was like, gold? Really? I don't know where it is. And I was you know, brainwashed by a communist. Money was evil. That's how I got in trouble. And <laughs> so I said, no, 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 I'm not going to start business because business is for people who hate their job and love money. And I hate money and love my job. I was, full, you know, I was naive enough to say I wasn't going to start the business, but so, I mean, not very much later, I did. The reason I started the company called Geomagic was I met this man, Chuck Hall. He is the inventor and founder of 3D Systems, today the largest 3D printing company. In 1983, 30 years ago, he printed very first parts on a stereo lithography machine. Now, put it in perspective, at that time, Macintosh didn't exist. And you don't even know how to connect CAD drawings with a printer. There wasn't connectivity. So the fact that he could even print the first part was a miracle. Now, what I didn't know was behind my back, you know, I have all this factory work in China because I, you know, I didn't really go to school to study the normal academics, I was, I was running machines. So that really attracted me. And I, my, my head just spun with possibilities, like the butterflies. Um, that was kind of what was in my mind. I was thinking, wow, if I could you know, start a business and I could connecting the real world with the virtual world, if we can capture all the things in the real world and then turn them into virtual world, and then this machine, you can push a button and it just prints them out. That has to be a great business. Um, so I went out, very naive, and did a pitch to raise money. I said, imagine walking into our Sedantic's office, watching your daughter's teeth being straightened into beautiful smile right in front of your eyes. Imagine walking into Nike's town, get your foot scanned, and come back to pick up a customized hiking shoes. I didn't think about beautiful shoes like this yet. <laughs> so um, I was talking, imagine, imagine, I said, those were ideas, and Geomagic is going to turn it into reality. And after my talk, people were coming, want to give me money. And, I, and there was one guy who just wrote a check and gave it to me. I said, no, 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 you can't do that. You have to talk to your attorney. He says, Ping, I am an attorney and just take my damn money. And so it was that easy, I started a business. <laughs> and this is my most proud work. Remember I said I wanted to be an astronaut before my dad died. Um, our technology was put on NASA space shuttle and Arlene Collins, the first female commander, ran that shuttle. Um, and my dad was watching CNN in China and he called me, he says, Ping, I am so proud of you. Now, I did not ever imagine a girl wanted to be an astronaut, couldn't be, would ever put technology on space shuttle and guarantee the safety return of the astronaut. Invisalign was how we started the business. Today, Invisalign makes 65,000 individual parts every day. And its assembly room is about twice the size of this room, and they make 7 million in aligners every year. Imagine that, how efficient that is. Of course, fun, right? You have to have some fun in work. That's sugar printing. <laughs> and, and that's a wedding cake for one of our designers. And fashion. Um, you saw that bag, black bag there. I have one here. This is 1969 LE. It's called LE 69, very famous bag. But it needs assembly here, but this is printed out in one piece, no assembly. So what's innovation? Um, someone said innovation is imagination applied. And let's see some of the imagination applied. Smithsonian wants to scan many of their collectibles and display it. In, their, in our national mall so people can actually touch it. This is an African whale, which will be the biggest 3D printing piece that's going to show up in our national mall, I believe, either next month or October. It's 
48 feet by 24 feet. This is a small test print. Um, elementary school kids come to our, you know, come, come to our office every weekend and they turn our foosball table into employees' heads. <laughs> From life sa saving to lifestyle, this uh, soccer player had a uh, prosthetics that looks just like his own feet because we scan his good legs and mirror image, right? And his body fools him, thinking that he never lost it. Jeff Immel, who is the successor of Jack Welsh, didn't say destroyyourself.com. He said 3D printing is the holy grail. It's on YouTube. You can see it. And what about our collective treasure? You know, UNESCO uh, registered historical site. They can all be captured, digitally preserved, and reproduced in its original form. You saw my shoe? <laughs> and um, this is going to consumer. Some people think it's all church keys. No, they're not. You know, many of those things are very useful. Um, I know, actually, if you watch that Jeff Emails um, YouTube, he says, oh, jet engine is holy holy uh, grail, but if you only talk about shoes, I'm not that interested. <laughs> so I have to make shoes there. Um, in fact, I, the other day in San Francisco, I was doing Google Hangout for White House, and they said, can you show something? I didn't have anything. So I just went to the office and print those shoes, <laughs> and I brought it to Google Hangout. So now imagine you can print them matching, you know, whatever, and you don't have to pack it, and, and there was an astronaut on the Google Hangout with me, he says, oh, I don't have to pack for my space thing, uh, expedition. I can just print it in space station. Yeah. That's a 3D printed guitar. So my time is up. Thank you. And I actually will have a book signing later, and you can come to touch whatever.